often as a professional that you get to introduce someone who is a role model to you, but also to um, be a daughter and be asked to introduce your father is pretty special. So um, I think I'm more nervous about this than I have been about anything in a while. Um, so <laughs> I'm just being glad they gave it to me. No. Um, so William H. Constantine, CEO of Akron Children's Hospital, for thir has been the CEO for 39 years. Um, he's dedicated both his career and personal life for improving pediatric care and the quality of life for children and, children and families. He is one of the longest tenured hospital chief executives in the country and is an um, internationally known advocate for issues affecting children's health and well-being. He is widely consulted by policymakers in both Columbus and Washington, D.C. He has served on many boards of healthcare, educational, and cultural organizations. Mm -hmm. Under his leadership, the hospital has grown into one of the nation's premier independent, integrated pediatric healthcare delivery systems. Akron Children's today is a $1 million, $1 million enterprise with more than 6,000 employees. Its clinical staff provides care at more than 1 million patient encounters annually through two hospital campuses, a network of more than 60 primary care, urgent care, and specialty care locations. Akron Children's collaborates with community partners to bring its neonatal and pediatric expertise to patients in their healthcare facilities. The system also comprises a pediatric home care company, a school health program, a captive insurance entity, and a charitable foundation. In 2009, Constantine was inducted into the Business Hall of Fame. He is a member of the Ohio uh, Business Roundtable and was appointed to the board of the John S. and John and James L. Knight Foundation in 2011. Constantine continues to serve on the boards of numerous Akron area community organizations and has been honored by many of these, including the American Lung Association, March of Dimes, Mental Health Association of Summit County, Akron Public Schools, and many others. In 2006, the American Red Cross honored him with the H. Peter Burr Community uh, Leadership Award. In 2011, the Akron Community Foundation presented him with the Bert A. Polsky Humanitarian Award in recognition of his many years of community service. In 2014, both United Way and Akron Children's honored him with his Distinguished Service Award. Throughout his career, he has embraced the philosophy of service above self. And I can say from watching him for many years, he has led this and this part of his values. He has been respected leader, ten, trusted mentor, engaging storyteller, and steadfast voice for children. <coughs> After Children's Hospital has a proud 128 year in, um, history of caring, and the hospital's mission of service has thrived under his guidance. In 2017, he published his first book, Leadership, Why He's Here Today. Um, and he lives in Akron with his wife, Rebecca. They've been married for 45 years, so hashtag relationship goals for those two. And um, he also has three grown children, which yes, we're all doing very well. And um, finally, he has two wonderful grandchildren. And I can say one of the best moments to see this man in is when he shows up in his suit and he gets down on the floor with the two, with the twins, and um, just starts crawling around as though it doesn't matter that he has a suit on. So, um, so with that, it's a pleasure to um, have you here today and speak on behalf of Hartar. Well, good morning, everybody. And Catherine, thank you for the nice introduction and not telling any stories. <laughs> The only thing I would add to that is I'm a South Akron kid. This is my town. I grew up here. And I'm standing before you because uh, the people that I interacted with as a child in this community believed in me. And they provided uh, opportunities. They provided new experiences. And they challenged me many, many times to get out of my comfort zone and meet new individuals. And as I look at the audience here today, we have a lot of people in this room that are true leaders, they're mentors, and they're people that believe in our community. Akron is a very proud community, and one of the reasons I'm here before you today is because of that pride. So I want to thank each and every one of you for what you do for our town. I want to thank you for bringing your very best to the game each and every day. And I want to make a special mention to Heart to Heart. And I think of the courage that Dr. Norm and Larry Bullman ahead when they came up with this idea. 
They brought the legal profession and the church profession together in a way no one had ever seen, quite honestly, here in this town. And they reached out to all of us. And I know at Children's Hospital, the heart-to-heart -heart groups that we have are very, very meaningful to the people that participate in those. In fact, just yesterday I was talking to one of our individuals who's here today. We were at a calling hours for one of our volunteers at Children's Hospital. And she was sharing with me that one of the most meaningful experiences she has, has had at Children's is the heart-to-heart -heart discussion that she has with fellow workers. And that would not have really played out if had not uh, Father Norm and Larry really put this program together. So put your hands together again for this wonderful organization. Well, it is a real uh, privilege to be with you today. Uh, when Jeremy and Father Norm asked if I would come and share a little bit about uh, the book, Leadership, but even more importantly about spirit-infused organizations, places that really focus on culture, focus on really bringing the very best out of their, their people. I, of course, said I'd love to be part of any conversation that brings that forward. I was trying to think of a theme for the conversation and sitting here in the table and seeing the sun come through these beautiful glass windows, I couldn't help but going right to one of the themes that's in my book, and it's being a sun catcher. So if there's any takeaway from the 25 minutes or so that we'll be talking with one another, I want you to think about the whole aspect of being a sun catcher and ask yourself if you're the type of individual that comes into a room and brings a radiant light with you. If you're the kind of a person, really, that brings that radio, radiant light into the lives of other folks. And through the listening skills and your other skill sets that you probably have, uh, making yourself even a better person, but even more importantly, helping those that benefit from your interaction with them. Let me give you a little bit of uh, background on a journey that led to uh, the leadership book that I'd be more than happy to sign, by the way, if any of you have brought it with you. Um, many, many years ago, I was asked to give a talk out in Medina, and I went out to give the talk, and what I was told is I was going to be giving a talk on the hospital that was founded in 1890, um, <laughs> by a group of women, by the way, from two different churches uh, who came together, and I could tell you a wonderful story there, but that would take all 25, 30 minutes. <laughs> but I was asked to give a talk and I got there and I looked at the program. And the program said that I was gonna be talking about leadership traits. And I had not thought about that. I thought I was talking about Children's Hospital and the story of Children's Hospital. So one of the traits that, tricks, I guess I would use that word even more than traits, that I had adopted many years ago is I had put the word leadership in the back of my head and I assigned two words to every letter. And when I thought about leadership, really internally, I'd think about the words that I assigned to each of those letters. For example, L, I had two words assigned to that, listen and learn. And I had really picked that up from my mom. How many times my mom would sit me down and just say, sit there, listen and learn. <laughs> have, have you had that experience along the way? Yeah. I had it many, and I still have it from my daughter and my wife now. <laughs> but when I was getting ready to come up to the podium, I thought, why don't I just share with the audience and try to get an interactive kind of conversation going with them. So about 250 people there, and I mentioned, let's talk about leadership. I'd like to hear it from your perspective. So put the word in your head, leadership, and let's start letter by letter. When you see the letter L and you're thinking of leadership, what words do you think of? And various things, words started being shared by the audience. It was a very successful conversation. Afterwards, people came up and said, I really hadn't thought about it that way. So that was the first time I had taken something I had internalized and shared it with others. It got put back on a shelf for a period of time until we were launching a leadership academy at Children's Hospital. And Catherine, for example, asked me to define leadership. And it was one of those things that came through the email. I had a bunch of other things I was doing. And my definition at the time was, leadership is, you know it when you see it. That was my definition. I'm 
right in front of me is Phil Maynard. When I see Phil Maynard, I think of leadership. So the people that were looking at that definition said that doesn't work. You have to be a little bit more specific than that. So Leadership Academy was launched and one of the first talks I gave was on the word leadership and assigning two words to every letter. And the feedback we received was very positive and I was encouraged to maybe put that in writing. And that led to, again, the whole process of trying to take that concept and put it in something that was entertaining and helpful to others. The key to it though, from my perspective was, someone said, Bill, if you're gonna do it, bring children's stories to the, the book. And as I've read the book more than once now, I have concluded that that book is really a thank you note. It's a thank you note from me to all the people that have touched my life. Starting with my parents. Starting with people like Pete Berg. It's a thank you note in there about coaches that I've had. Teachers I've had. I gave a talk to a group recently and I was trying to share an experience and I used the word bad, and I do use the word bad in the book, in one of the chapters. I talk about bad coaches, I mention bad teachers, uh, you know, bad experiences you have. A teacher came up to me after the talk and said, I really enjoyed what you said, but why did you have to use the word bad? When I read your book, I don't see a lot of negative words in that book, but to her, bad was a negative word. So when I rewrite another edition, I think I'm going to take the word bad out. I mean, I did have coaches that were not good coaches. Maybe they had the right, wrong style. And for me to judge them as bad, that probably was not what I should have done. I have had teachers that did not connect with me. I did have bosses that did not connect or inspire me. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. And the lesson that is in all that for, I believe, everyone in this room is I learned a lot of lessons from those experiences. Matter of fact, I learned more lessons from those experiences than I learned from lessons that were taught to me from men and women that were phenomenal role models. Phenomenal. But those that didn't have the certain skill set or were blessed with certain traits I could see how they impacted me, I could see how they impacted others, and that told me I gotta be different if I ever have that opportunity. So I listened to someone that heard me give a talk about the leadership book, and I can tell you in another edition, I probably won't use the word bad, because there's not a lot of negative words, I hope, in the leadership book. The key to at least the message in there though are the stories about the kids. And as I said earlier, this is a thank you note to them. You know, one of the stories that starts the book, and by the way, Father Norm owes me a royalty. I mentioned heart to heart on page 12 of this book. <laughs> page 12, Norm. I spelled your name right and everything in it. Page 12. Uh, and I do mention in there the whole concept of when you speak heart to heart, what that does for everyone. And I just, again, I saluted once, I'll salute again the wonderful work that this organization does. But the story that kicks off the book is a story of a little girl named Angie. And if you've read the book and have read the story, I apologize for going over it again, but it is the message that I want to leave you today, and that's the message about being a sun catcher. This little girl had a horrible disease. It was a cancer. And it wasn't curable. Yet the family decided they wanted to benefit from more days with Angie. So she did go through the treatments, the chemo and the radiation and every conceivable treatment that was available in those days. Now I'm talking about 30 years ago. Angie would be in her early 40s today. But when she was a patient at Children's Hospital, and she came into the hospital, the whole organization knew she was there. She had a spirit that was infused with positive attitude. And you couldn't miss it when you interacted with this little girl. And she just had a way of becoming actually the caregiver. 
She knew that she was never going to go to a prom. She knew that she was never going to be married and have a child. She had figured that out. And because of her connection with Grace and the blessings that she had from her family's support system, she had an inner peace. And she knew that her job was really to bring that inner peace to caregivers and to her family and her siblings. And this little girl could do it. It was amazing. I got to know that family, and any time I interacted with her, I came away a better person because of it. I remember a situation, University of Akron football team, the captains always come and visit the hospital when they have home games. They come on a Friday when they were playing on Saturdays, now they play all different kinds of days of the week. But they would come on Friday afternoon, see the uh, patients, and then have the game on Saturday. And it just so happened this Friday they came to the hospital. They had, this was their first home game out at Rubber Bowl. Uh, they had had two away games, their money games, and they had lost both of them. Uh, they had been beaten by Virginia Tech, I think, and by Florida. So they were 0-2. So when they came to the hospital, the nurses and everybody knew that Angie was there. Angie was a sports fan, and she would have loved to have seen the team. So they brought the captains up to the floor, and the nurses said, when you go into the room, Angie's wearing a bandana, she's just gone through some treatments. Her eyes are pretty sunken into her head because of those treatments. But this little girl's spirit is phenomenal, so don't feel sorry for her. So they walk in the room, and immediately, the first thing that is said is said by Angie. She says, okay guys, just because you're 0-2 does not mean you can't win your conference. <laughs> she gives them a pep talk. And you know, the tears are coming down these big fellas' faces. Uh, Jerry Faust could not believe it. Uh, they come out in the hallway, uh, they're hugging one another. And then the next morning at the Rubber Bowl before the Central Michigan game, I went to the locker room and these young men gave an inspirational talk. Uh, it really was something to hear. The story would be great if they would have beaten Central Michigan. <laughs> but Angie wasn't on the field. But, but she was a phenomenal young girl and one of the things she did, she used our art therapy program and she painted sun catchers. And she would give those sun catchers to nurses, to doctors, to her siblings, to her friends. She gave dozens and dozens of sun catchers to people. And I thought, as I reflected on it, that you know, she was just passing on who she was because she was a sun catcher. I mean, there was not a time when I was with that little girl where there wasn't a radiant light that came from those eyes. And it really caused me at even that point in time to say, I gotta start looking at things through a child's eyes at Children's Hospital, not my eyes. But look through the eyes of a child. Let's design everything we do through the eyes of a child. And I credit Angie uh, for teaching me that lesson early on. When she died, her mom came, her mom Joyce came and met with me and said, I just wanna share with you the special bond we now have with the Children's Hospital family. And she talked about all the things that really were very important to them during their journey with their daughter. She also said, though, you can be better. And I wanted to know how we could be better. And listened to her story, then had people like Georgette Constantino, who we all know, meet with her. And from that interaction, and from what Angie really brought to all of us, we formed a parent advisory committee at the hospital. A parent advisory committee developed a parent mentor program. We have over a hundred parent mentors right now that are there to team up with other parents that have just been admitted that have a child with a rare diagnosis. And we can team those families up with families that have been through what they're getting ready to go through. That all happened because Angie and her mom Joyce had an idea. After our first year of running the Parent Advisory Committee, we had a celebration dinner. It was an emotional day because it was the day Pete Berg died for me. And I went to the dinner, and at the dinner, Angie's mom, Joyce, stood up and said, I just want to thank the hospital for everything that we've done this past year. I also, though, want to present a couple of gifts to people. 
And it just so happened that Angie had not finished two sun catchers before she died. The corner panels of the sun catcher were not painted in yet. Joyce's mom keeps one at home and she looks at it every day. Or Angie's mom, Joyce, keeps one at home and she looks at it every day to remind her that her work of uh, being Angie's mom is never done, even though Angie died over 30 years ago. That other sun catcher is in my office. And I look at that sun catcher every day to remind me our work at Akron Children's is never done as long as there's a child out there that can benefit from the resource that this community believes in. So when you're thinking about what you do and how you do it, uh, just keep that word sun catcher in your mind and try to apply to your skill set what that really means and how you can be that radiant light in the lives of others. I mean, it's something that, again, I was taught by a 13-year-old little girl. As you read through the book and go through all the letters, you know, there's two E's in the word letter, leadership. Uh, I use the word empower, I use the word excite, I use the word bring energy all the time to the table. And I use the word earn, because leadership is something that you have to earn each and every day, each and every minute of every day. Uh, the A in the word leadership and the words I applied to that are being action-oriented and attitude. We all know what a negative attitude does to your energy. We all know what a positive attitude does. You're in charge of your own attitude. My mom told me that many times. My dad wouldn't say it in words, but his a uh, boot in the butt would uh, <laughs> tell me that it was all about attitude. And when you go through the D, uh, I believe that's being dedicated. People know when you're genuine. People know when you're dedicated, especially kids. You know, you can't fool a child. Mm -hmm. Believe me. I've tried to do that with the two grandkids right now, and they just look at me like, you know what you're doing. Get over it. <laughs> so it is about being very dedicated. Then the other D I use is dream. I mean, it's so important to think about the impossible and make it possible. To think about the improbable and make it probable. I do not like conversation, we can't do it. Why can't we do it? Well, it's never been done that way. Well, maybe we should see if we can make it so we can do it a different way. And I have a wonderful team here. I don't know, we're paying overtime to hear me talk today. <laughs> We have more employees here than I usually see at the hospital. <laughs> uh, but you got a dream. And in the chapter on dream, I do talk about my dear friend, Pete Berg. And I hope you read that chapter. You know, Pete and I, when we grew up together, he's an East Akron kid, I'm a South Akron kid. But we were connected on many, many occasions through CYO. And then at the University of Akron, we really bonded uh, relative to a number of initiatives we worked on. But we were at a leadership conference in Atlanta, Georgia, when we were in school at the University of Akron. And it just so happened we were there when Dr. Martin Luther King was killed in Memphis, Tennessee in 1968. And it was the first night of the conference when the word of that came to student leaders from around the country and the whole tenor of the conference changed. The whole agenda changed. And we met in groups and talked about the world that was the one we were uh, in. We talked about the communities we came from. And one night, we all kind of put uh, arm to arm, hand to hand, and we had a vow that we made to one another that as we would go into our uh, communities and then go get our degrees and then go into a career that we were going to focus not on ourselves we were going to focus on others we were going to focus on a community we were going to focus on justice we were going to focus on uh, social interaction and civility with one another and Pete would remind me of that on a routine basis when I came back to Akron in 1979 and we started just talking about the things that he would do you know, Pete was involved in everything. He was a busy man. But if you asked him to do something for Red Cross, he never said no. He always said yes. Then he'd pick up the phone and call me to say yes. And if I said yes, I would pick up the phone and call Pete 
to say yes. But see, that's what we need to do as a community. We do need to do, and we need to do more of that as a community. So there's a wonderful story about Pete in the book. There's some great stories about a young girl, Abby, in the book. Um, and the way that she believed in beating her cancer. And her belief was so strong that she did. She beat her cancer, and she's a beautiful mom today to two children. And you just love to hear those kind of stories. So as I'm going through the book, I talk about uh, our, it's all about being respectful in what we do. Respect is the lifeblood of an organization. If you lose respect in your organization, your culture suffers dramatically, and you don't get it back. If you lose, lose respect in your organization, that spirit-infused uh, attitude that generates this inner peace gets lost. Respect is so important to one another, and you always need to make sure that you're the one being respectful, even when you're disrespected. Don't bite back. Get to a higher level. Get to a higher level. When I look at the word, the letter S, uh, servant, we've talked about that. Heart to heart's all about servant leadership. Uh, serve others above self and you're a better person because of it. And then the other S, the word I applied to it is be a storyteller. People love stories. My grandchildren love when I read books to them. And what I do often now is I'll make up what's in the book. I don't read the words, I use my own. <laughs> and they actually listen more to that than they do when I read the regular words. Be a storyteller. We all have stories, especially when you put meaning behind those stories and tie them to an experience. The H, I love two words I put there. One is being humble. Share what you do with others. Make sure the spotlight hits the people that really need that spotlight and deserve that spotlight. And then the other one is humor. If you can't laugh at yourself, if you can't bring that smile to your work and to your interaction with others, you're missing a wonderful opportunity. And that humor is just so, so important. Uh, you know, when you laugh, it creates, uh, I got a physician over here, he'll tell me it's some kind of endorphin or enzyme that makes you feel better. It is important. So I would do that. The I in there, I do talk a lot about being uh, intellectually independent. Don't just follow fads. We all know right from wrong. And when you see wrong, and it's coming from peers and colleagues and others, you're gonna feel pressure not to say anything. No, come on, use that intellectual independence to make sure that we're staying on the right uh, road together. And then the other one is improvement. There's a physician in Cincinnati I've gotten to know over the years and done some work with. And when she heard I was thinking of doing a book and putting two words to every letter, she actually said, now when you get to I, don't forget improvement. Because we can never be satisfied with status quo. And in the healthcare world, we could never get away for not talking about how we can be better. Improve, improve, improve. And I know at Children's Hospital, the level of quality improvement that's played out because of our people focusing on that improvement on a day-to-day -day basis is something we all should be enormously proud of. At Children's Hospital, we're there to heal and do no harm. And when we do harm, and it happens, unintentionally, but it happens, we need to learn from that. And we have. And if you look at surgical site infections have dropped at our place, readmission rates have dropped at our place, medication errors have dropped at our place. Chris Young, our head of chief nursing, nursing officer, she could go on and on and on about all the improvements that are daily occurring at Children's Hospital because of a focus on never being satisfied with status quo, always trying to be better. And we need to do that not only in the organizations we're with, but start with yourself. We all can be better. And then the P, I just talk about what a privilege it is to be in a leadership position, so never take it for granted. And leadership is all about people. I mean, it's all about people, starting with yourself. And never take yourself too serious. Really look at, again, working with others. So there's a wonderful stories in the book about children. Uh, I was at a graduation this past two weekends ago. One of the young men I talk about in the book is Caleb. Uh, Caleb is a real inspiration. He just graduated from Firestone High School now, and he has a scholarship to Mount Union. Uh, we went to that graduation party. 
and the support that he has felt from others, now he is passing on to other people he deals with. He's really a remarkable young man. Uh, a little Ridge Miller, I talk about Ridge, a little boy that spent every Christmas of his life over a five year period of time at Children's Hospital. He had a horrible, horrible disease and he never knew it. He was born with it. And when he passed away, I went to the funeral and his mom Donna came up to me and it was such a wonderful eulogy they had given for Little Ridge. And I asked, you know, I mean, a five-year-old dying is hard. Yet you, you know, painted a picture of such a happy young man. And she said he was. He never knew pain. He thought everybody uh, had pain because he was born with it. But what he learned over a five-year period of time, because he had such a horrible disease, people just came to him all the time to be supportive. And at about an age of two or three, he was starting to give all that love back to other people. And when you went in to visit, visit Ridge in his room, about uh, four years old, he was one of our miracle children, because he defied all the odds uh, nationally. But to get into Ridge's room around our radiothon, he had a big old canister. He had to put money in <laughs> to go visit Ridge. So I walked in one day and I dropped some change in, it went clink, 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 clink. And he said, Mr. C, don't you have any dollars? <laughs> so we hired Ridge, by the way. He worked in development. Uh, yeah. But, I mean, those stories, that's the essence of the book. And of course, I talk about my parents. My dad passed away four years ago, and we had the service at St. Vincent's. And we did a little poem about my dad, and it was just a phrase, uh, he's my dad. And over my life and those of my siblings, those words, he's our dad, uh, brought a real feeling of security to all of us. Uh, because he was our dad, we felt safe. Because he was our dad, when we went to the house, and we lived in South Akron, one could say it was a rough neighborhood, but it was our neighborhood. But at home, we were safe. Didn't have to worry about getting beat up. Out in the street, now and then, yes, but never by my dad. And there was just this feeling of being supported. So one of the lessons there is when I walk around Children's Hospital and they call me dad, because I'm getting to be that age now, <laughs> I take that as a real compliment. And I want our people at Children's to feel safe. I really do. I want them to know that we support what they're doing and we're going to do everything we can to make sure that their job's not threatened. That they're there not worrying about are they going to have a job tomorrow, but they're really worrying about what can I do to treat that child that we're so privileged to be caring for. So I talked a little bit about that lesson in that book. But as I wrapped it up, it's a thank you letter. I hadn't thought about that until the other day when I looked at it. It's just a thank you to all those children. It's a thank you to my parents, of course. And it's a thank you to this community and all of you. So let me uh, answer questions. Yes. yes. OK, let's stop. Right, 10 minutes. <laughs> Let's do yeah. a wake-up call. I have a comment that I would just love to thank you and the hospital for the Doggy Brigade. I am on the Doggy Brigade. It brings so much joy, and it, it's 25 years now, and it brings so much joy. So thank you to everyone at the hospital for all the love and support you give the Doggy Brigade team. Doggy Brigade is a real home run. You know, when the volunteers, and we were founded by volunteers at Children's Hospital, so the best compliment you can give to anybody that's part of the children's family is cause them, call them a volunteer. But our volunteers several years ago came up with the idea that they wanted to have a doggy brigade. And no hospital in the country had a canine uh, component to their healthcare program. So the proposal came to our medical staff executive committee and we used to meet in the evening, went pretty long, and the infectious disease physician and surgeons and others said, no way we're bringing dogs into the hospital. 
<laughs> and a couple of our board members said, no, wait, let's pause. Yeah. Uh, this hospital was founded by volunteers. This is an idea that's come from volunteers. Why don't we try, you know, a three-month trial? So they said, okay. The poor dogs were in that first three-month trial. They went through more testing than a monkey that went to space. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, so, you know, we're off and running. And it just so happened there was a little girl that had come in for a routine appendectomy. And she had had some surger surgery. Uh, okay, I'm on and off. She had some surgery. And when she came out of surgery, you know, she kind of uh, fell back a little bit. Started uh, bedwetting. Uh, she felt, uh, you know, maybe intimidated by her parents. She didn't like what the experience she had. Uh, she stopped eating. Uh, she wasn't talking to anybody. Uh, a routine incision became infected, so she didn't get discharged. She's in the hospital. The infectious disease doctor was working with her, the surgeon that didn't like the idea, a dogger brigade was working with her, and another a person on the medical team. And they were at the foot of the bed when a dog walked by the hallway. And the nurse noticed that the little girl noticed the dog. So they brought the dog in, it was a collie, and within about a minute, uh, the collie was in bed with her, which broke one of the rules, but <laughs> she was petting the collie. The nurse said, would you like to watch a movie with the, the dog? She said, sure. All of a sudden, she started talking. She got better. Dogger Brigade solved the problem. <laughs> so 25 years later, we have the, one of the largest Dogger Brigade programs and a horse, Petey the Pony, and now we have Willie Nelson visiting kids. <laughs> Another story, I'm sorry. Yes? What was the toughest part of your career and how did you get through it? Wow, that's a good question. Toughest part of my career. Well, you know, I've been blessed, quite honestly. When I was hired at Children's Hospital uh, 39 years ago, I'm so happy there's so much I didn't know that I didn't know. Um, because that gave me an opportunity to, again, learn from others and observe. Uh, you know, one of the challenges that is out there, and it's just a challenge, is always getting people to, to believe in the power of collaboration. We can't do it by ourselves. Uh, I've had some failures of collaborative initiatives I've tried to make happen, uh, and maybe that was it. I tried to make them happen instead of getting people to believe in what that meant for them and them take ownership of it. Uh, but uh, there's no more important time now, I think, than us coming together in collaborative ways. Uh, and, and it's a challenge, too. Uh, you know, you, now and then, I've been, since I've been there 39 years, I'll say, who in the heck made that decision? And they all look at me. Uh, <laughs> so you got to live up to those decisions. And, and if they're not working anymore, move on, move on. Here's a fraternity brother, I'm in trouble. <laughs> and what do you see as the biggest challenge in healthcare right now? I mean, as far as well, that's a, sure. yeah. Well, you know, one of my, and Phil and some board members are gonna get a kick out of this, Greg McDermott. I really do worry about the lack of priority we have on our children in our healthcare initiatives. A lot of people do not know and are not aware, even our elected officials, that here in Ohio we have 2.5 million children. 1.3 million of those children are on Medicaid. In the United States, we have 70 million children. 40 million of those children are on Medicaid. Medicaid is the largest uh, funder of health care for kids in this country. And the general public views Medicaid as a welfare program. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to fund it. And a ph physician that treats a Medicaid patient is usually paid about 30 to 40 percent lower than what a physician that treats uh, an adult patient through Medicare. Medicaid is very fragmented. The, there's 50 states, there's 50 Medicaid programs. We're a Medicaid provider in Pennsylvania. We're a Medicaid provider in West Virginia. We're a Medicaid provider here in Ohio. Um, and they're all different. And last year at Children's, we had a patient from every, every state in the United States came to Children's last year. We had 85 of the 88 counties sent us a kid to the hospital last year, and we have 22 countries. And there's no rhyme or reason for the payment model for pediatric health care. So one of the things I'm going to try to work on a little more, uh, even next year, 
is try to get uh, our state, number one, to have a cabinet position that focuses on kids, but to try to spin our children out of Medicaid into their own program. And at the federal level, it would be great if we could do that. But none of that happens fast. Uh, and I don't want to focus just on payment, but I, I do think that if we had a separate initiative around kids' health care, we'd be talking more about obesity. We'd be talking more about the behavioral issues that are going on. We'd be talking more about dental service. We have a program, we're in 30 school districts with our school nurses and school aides at Children's Hospital. Uh, we don't make money on that. But we, as our mission statement says, and our promise is say, we need to treat every child as if that child's our own. And when we see stuff coming into our hospital that's a social pathology, not a medical pathology, we know we need to get out beyond our walls and try to make a difference. So that took us into the schools. When we listen to our school nurses and school aides, they'll tell us that behavioral issues are top of the list within the schools and dental. So we opened a dental clinic uh, two years ago, three years ago. We're swamped. And we had 28 different languages last year that our interpreters handled within our dental service. Uh, and there's just so many of those kind of gaps that are out there that I'd like to see closed, and I think it would be closed if we could do something by focusing on kids. Kids' health care, when you look at the cost of health care, there's plenty of money in the system right now, in my mind. Some of my colleagues would disagree with me. But we need to be a little bit more regulated in terms of what we're doing with pharmaceuticals. We need to be a little bit more regulated what we're doing with all these appliances and the like that turn us into, uh, I mean, it's important. I might need a new knee. So you, don't, so, you know, you don't say no to those kind of things. But the cost of those appliances and the margins that they run are just out of control right now. Uh, so uh, I think there's a lot we can do, and we want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Yes? One more question. That's I just wanted to say thank you for such a very heart-touching and inspiring presentation this morning. I know it has really impacted me, and you can feel the essence and presence of authenticity, and I wanted to thank you for that. And I also wanted to make a comment regarding when you said connect with grace to have the inner peace. That is very a very profound statement, and based on that statement, I would want to suggest rather than taking out bad if you redo the book because is bad really bad if we learn from the challenges that life will, will present to us so maybe rewrite that chapter and use the word replace the word bad with something a different word but show even when we deal with the quote unquote negative as she saw it in negative something positive can still come out of it when we connect with the grace to have it. I like that suggestion, and uh, we'll make sure that happens. We really will. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Have a great day. Thank you so much um, for spending the time with us and your presence. And I, I think about walking away here with the many things that you shared with us, one of which is, if you don't like his words for leadership, he said from the get-go, create your own. Mm -hmm. You can take a look at that yourself. And the other thing is this aspect of uh, what one can do and as an individual and as a collective group of leaders who you said, I'd like us to do more of this, coming together with an intention of building a community of collaboration. And there are many in this room who have worked toward that end, and you are certainly one of them. And thank you for that thank so you. much. We do have a gift for you from heart to heart. I'm sort of dangling it here um, that represents our gratitude. Thank you so much. And thank you to everybody for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much.